Um, moving from diversity to harmonization in media classification, that was our, our topic the last two days. And I'd like to welcome Stefan Dreyer from Max Hans Bredo Institute in Hamburg. He not only observed our discussion very thoroughly, he also did research in this field. And now he combines his observation and his research in his keynote. Please. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for still being around, um, ex despite the weather, despite the fact that uh, you just had a fantastic lunch. So, thanks. Um, this is uh, maybe the most unforgiving spot to talk at a conference because everybody has said everything that could be thought of. So, um, with a view uh, of this um, prerequisites, uh, I rated the presentation X. <laughs> so, what what I've um, planned to do with you is to give a mixture of a synthesis of this conference from a specific perspective, mainly that of cooperation and how cooperation can help in harmonizing things. Um, and the the four points I'd like to raise today are uh, the current status quo and ob observable trends when it comes to minor protection, good practices that we can identify, um, and dilemmas that we run into, and how harmonization can be a solution to, to the challenges that we, that we identify. <clears throat> and at last, um, I'd try to collect from the last 48 hours all the instances or examples of cooperation um, that you have uh, been part of. So, um, being as a researcher at the Hans Bredo Institute um, comes with research, um, media research in this case, and there's a recent study for uh, the Swiss government that we conducted um, where the Swiss government currently is a, in a process of changing their whole uh, youth protection legislation and um, collect the, the power from the different cantons towards the federal level. And they, at least they tried a tabula rasa approach. They were open for anything. And to be as open as possible, they wanted to know how do the other uh, countries cope with the challenges. So there's a report that um, tried to compare 14 different youth protection frameworks across all kinds of media. Um, and uh, also have, have, have a side look at the media education initiatives going on in, in those con countries. The countries that we um, looked at were Australia, Austria, Denmark, Germany, Finland, France, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Sweden, Switzerland, Slovenia, and the UK. So this is only a choice of the frameworks, uh, frameworks that we find all around the world. Um, and what we came up with is not a real um, giant surprise for us all. There is fragmentation everywhere, and it's uh, on a very high level. Uh, everything's fragmented, if you say so. Um, and we found only a few adaptions. Um, those, are, those are research um, findings from 2013 and 14, so maybe there are more, but we only found few adaptions to convergent media environments. Um, what we did is to get a grasp of what's going on in these manage, ma uh, manifold frameworks of youth protection is to try to cluster those models. And for that to do, we crossed the number of media types that are regulated within those frameworks <coughs> by formal laws with the number of different regulatory models um, or applicable frameworks. Uh, legal frameworks that the state shows. And we came up with four different models. And I think they s are still accurate. Um, I'm not so much um, sure uh, uh, regarding Finland because they just recently, uh, Norway because they just recently adapted. But nevertheless, there are those four different models w which we call the federal models. Those are the countries where a lot of smaller pieces of that nation have their own legislation. Austria, for instance, or Switzerland, 
uh, with there are almost 20 cantons and each canton has its own legislation and legislation later framework and supervisory body and stuff like that so um, the the model that you find um, in most countries that we examined uh, are the so-called dichotomous models. So it's, it's still the traditional uh, differentiation between offline and online. So we have an offline youth protection uh, framework and uh, one for online or electronic media in general, like broadcasting, video on demand, and, and online well, websites. Um, then there are those few convergence models, uh, convergent models that, that you can find already. Um, we we said that for Norway, Finland, and Netherlands, where they have a legal framework that is applicable to, to more kinds of media uh, encompassing online and offline media. And then we try to be polite and we call it the minimalist models. Those are models where you barely find any legal framework. So maybe the AVMS is um, implemented, but nothing more. So all the youth protection that is going on in those states is either non-existent or based on sole private uh, codes of conduct of industry, for instance. And I brought uh, another matrix with me. That's very small, but you don't uh, have to read everything. Those are the actual age groups that the different legal frameworks uh, establish. So uh, in the top row, you find the, the years or the uh, age brackets that are being used. And you can already get a glance and grasp that there's fragmentation going on with some peaks. So um, there's the zero, the 12 is commonly used, and then, well, around 15 and 16, like we saw already, and the 18, of course, as the top of the mark. Um, the these brackets are always artificial. Uh, well, Wim mentioned that um, the age brackets in the Netherlands are based on research, but those are statistical insights, um, and you always have a high variety of different developed children in each of those brackets. So um, if, you, if you want to base age brackets on research, you shouldn't do age brackets at all, but you should look at the individual child, which doesn't make any sense. But having this in mind, and I think it was Pat Vance who said um, that these are triggers or flags for parents, so they don't have to stick to the day of the birthday of the child, and then he can watch a 15 or 16 plus film. It's just a, a marker for them, an orientation point. Um, so the, the insight of, we try to compare a lot of different things, but the main insight is that we find that all those um, states examined follow very different national pathways with a lot of context factors um, that, well, differ from each other. So they all have the reasons to do policy like they do, um, so that, that, is, that comes naturally out of those different um, nation states. They are not blind for the challenges that are ahead when it comes to modern media environments or de developing new usage patterns of miners. Uh, however, they react on a very one-to-one um, -one, uh, situation-based um, climax, so to say. I'll say something else on that uh, later on. And because they do not act systematically or structurally uh, or rational in some cases even, um, they, you find those different states in very different stadiums when it's, when it's coming to coping with the, with the modern challenges. So I tried to bring some observable trends. So what's going on? Where's the train headed? Um, these are only built from the 14 countries that we examined, but nevertheless, they are often backed also during the last two, two days uh, by experiences in, in other countries. So regarding content classification in general, the, the AVMS is everywhere, even in those countries that don't have to implement the AVMS directive, for instance, Norway or even Australia. So you find those um, those regulatory ideas in all those countries that we ha have had a look at. 
um, especially when it comes to television and video on demand. Um, and this video on demand part of the AVMS directive led to the consequence that many traditional classification bodies have extended their scopes from television onto video on demand. In some other countries, they have established new regulators for those things. Uh, and what you also found, find in, in all the examined countries is that there's crime law um, established for specific harmful media content. Um, however, if you look at specific online frameworks outside the AVMS directive, so no audiovisual um, video on demand services, but l maybe user generated content platforms, video platforms, stuff like that, there there are basically no legal frameworks except in Australia and Germany. So you don't find any online uh, legal frameworks for, for these types of media. That brings with it the consequence that you don't find any electronic labels online in all of those countries. D um, there are some de developments going on. As you know, Germany has um, a framework for electronic website labels since 2011 in fact, um, Russia has introduced in 2012 an electronic label labeling framework and um, UK's Cameron promised to uh, have something for 18 plus websites, um, including age verification tools. But if you look closer, especially to the user generated content or large community sites, then you will find um, types of electronic labels already. When you think of YouTube, for instance, then you have those age-gated videos or um, the ones that you have to register for to see. Those are electronic age labels, basically, because you cannot access the video unless you do something specifically. So it's a, an electronic marker that tells you you cannot access this video freely. So what we found is that there's under the uh, scope of the legal framework. There's a huge wave of internal or self or community-based ratings um, and content classification swapping into many of those online services already without any legal framework um, in place. Another thing is that the technical measures are well, somehow trendy. Everybody's talking about uh, technical tools as instruments of child protection. Um, but they are, if you compare the different countries and the public discourses that you find there, um, they are an apple of discord. They are partly heavily, heavily debated, um, highly debated among public, but also among the different stakeholders. Um, so you will find different approaches how to cope with those technical tools, somehow implement technical tools in the legal framework. Others will never do that. Um, and the industry factually then, then takes something of those things. When it comes to, the, to legislators, what you found is um, that they are surprised by the challenges. So they don't have any clue and then um, in, in case of incidents or events or news reports, um, that lead to political discussions and sometimes even civil, civil unrest, if you think of the uh, so-called Gothenburg Instagram riots. So there, there is a public outcry and then the policymakers uh, react to that um, and adapt legal frameworks or issue some guidelines or implement new media education um, curricula. So the issues that are deemed most important uh, right now um, in the different states that we examined are the, especially the, the case of cyberbullying, but also sexualization, high fat, salt or sugar foods, advertising privacy, excessive online game uh, or uh, online usage, and user-generated content and the respective platform liability that, that comes with those. Those things. So overall, as I said, we have um, different stadiums of tackling those challenges, um, leading again to a, an even more fragmented legal framework um, among all those states. So um, 
Fragmentation is not only the age groups, as we have seen, but also the classification bodies, the regulatory approaches they take, regulatory instruments, or the inclusion of media education and uh, respective initiatives um, helping to protect. So, very short, um, the good practices that we found, it's not all bad. Um, everybody's trying to cope with those challenges and s sometimes they even have good ideas in, in doing so. We found on a, on a very high flying level, we found several aspects that good practice and youth media protection um, uh, can, can be. So on the big picture, uh, coordinated policy structures within governments, one central agency, for instance, coordinating all the different uh, political stakeholders in a, in a nation state. Embeddedness of new players that have not been part of the public discourse or the political forums. So embedding those in policy discussions uh, is helping a lot. Coordinated sustainable multi-stakeholder forums, not only ad hoc meet meetings or roundtables, but sustainable forums where all those stakeholders can, can speak. Supporting infrastructures for self and co-regulatory initiatives. So you help them to help themselves or to provide ideas in this context. And the balancing between protection and media literacy initiatives is um, also a very good practice. Um, if you try to implement technical protection measures, thoughtful integration is the good practice that you have to do and not just use it because it's there. When it comes to a closer look on content classification, uh, we found well, three different um, levels of implementing age classification systems in convergent media environments. So the most basic one that you often find at different states is that you use the same age brackets among all different, across all different media types, um, but you have different classification systems or schemes after that and procedures. If you go ahead, then you will find some classification systems um, that also use the same brackets um, and use the same classification scheme, but different bodies that are responsible to do so. And in most convergent um, environments, you will find one classification system with one media classifier, and this classifier can classify any media that is available. So the dilemma that that now turns up is that the politics all scream, we need to go international. Everything's international, everything's global. We need to do that do too. But there is no international political player right now with the power to enforce something like, like a, an international youth protection framework. That's a dilemma that um, can be found in all those states because they try to cope with the internationalization of media products, but they just cannot because the political uh, power stops at the nation border. And um, another a good practice that we found are those things where technical measures uh, are not only um, giving a yes or no decision, but enabling p parents to, to um, actually implement their media, ed media education decision. Um, or try to raise children's media literacy. So there are points where technical <coughs> tools can help if they help the parents to implement their decisions. And just one hint, because we often heard the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, of course the child has a right to information and communication. And of course there's something evolving out of this. And also uh, from the Lisbon Treaty on the European uh, level. So there is the obligation of policymakers to consider those rights of the child. But there's also, in Article 5, the, uh, the right for parents to educate their children. And you have to consider that when you talk about technical tools. So some parents might even require technical <coughs> tools to implement their media education to the, towards their children. So what can we say now about harmonization? Is that a solution? Um, well, we heard strong arguments that harmonization runs into limitations when it, when it comes to uh, harmonizing different um, regions and states. Um, but you won't get to do anything with a fragmented system like that. 
and international or global distributed media content. Thank you. So you, what you need is a stable and agreed framework of provision, concerted measures, um, and even agreed practices to overcome those, those challenges. Um, in fact, it's, the, it's the, the end of the nation state as we know it um, when it comes to worldwide distribution um, chains or communication networks. So how to cope with that? Um, in theory, it would look like this where everybody has his own opinion and in a harmonized, fully harmonized system, everybody says the same, has the same meaning on everything. Um, so that, this is called full harmonization and it's a dream of the European Commission um, to, to have exactly that. But as we have seen, that, that won't never happen. Why? Because there are hurdles. And we heard a lot of those hurdles. Uh, the most Practical one is that there's just no legal competency for the European Commission to, to give more than they actually do with the AVMS directive. So we won't have full harmonization regarding those things. We have different cultural backgrounds and values. Um, I find the argument from Anemette very striking. As long as you only have national public discourses ending at the border of each of the member states, you, you will never get a harmonized classification system. That's just not possible. What you need is a European public sphere. And if you look in the newspaper, the European public sphere is so far away like never before. So we won't get any fully harmonized European public, uh, Euro European scheme with national public discourses. Uh, we have different histories um, as regards content classification, also different concepts of childhood and youth um, that play a different role uh, or an important role. Um, and we shouldn't forget that the states have different capacities to build up this policy fields. Some states have totally other issues to deal with if you think of Greece, for instance, right now. So youth protection is not the central problem for those societies. And we heard very relevant arguments when it comes to content classification regarding trust. So you need trust when someone else is guiding you through the media environment. You, you have to really rely on, on this guide. So um, you just cannot put up a new system and everybody's happy and will follow you. You have to build trust. And if you want to know how long that takes, please ask Nikam or Peggy, which uh, have put a lot of money in building up trust with, with the respective target groups. And in the end, a very practical argument, um, what we find is that you only have two different industry players around. One who says that, um, well, I, I'm already active in technical protection or corporate social responsibility. I don't feel any obligation to put more efforts in this field. So we do it already, so what's the hustle? What, what do you want from us? And the other half, half says, I don't understand why they should do anything at all, as it's not part of being legally compliant because there's no, no uh, legal provision for me. Why should we do something that we don't have to? Those are the two things, and that leads to um, a, a search for new incentive systems for those companies. What about informal political pr pressure, as we see in the UK, for instance? Um, or formal legal obligations in Germany, as we have seen in the last years. <clears throat> however, however, to overcome all these challenges, all these hurdles, um, the idea also of this conference was to look closer at cooperation. So can, can cooperation help us um, in, interna in internationalization? Um, can, can that be a starting point for, for building factual harmonization. And in fact, cooperation, as you all know, is a starting point for almost everything. And when it comes to society, politics, uh, invention, whatsoever, you always need cooperation. Um, so not surprisingly, cooperation is a rather traditional mechanism when it comes to harmonization, especially in areas where, where legal provisions cannot provide formal harmonization due to lack of competencies or whatsoever. So the usual European Commission approach is then set the policy objectives, set the agenda, um, build a network of expert agencies, mostly independent um, as far as that works out, um, 
so the Commission has some network to talk to, support them in networking and exchanging um, knowledge, and then push them into something like codes of practice, codes of conduct, best practice guidelines, stuff like that. And then you have the factual harmonization uh, through cooperation, and that's what the Commission calls soft regulation then, because they don't have hard regulation at hand. This leads to uh, manifold different forms of co cooperation, and I only brought some criteria if you want to categorize those things. Um, the areas where those co cooperation efforts take place are norms, processes, actors, the overall result or outcome, but also evaluation or just simple exchange of knowledge or networking. And you can also differ between, especially in our case, between content rating and the content labeling stuff. So you, you can harmonize the one without harmonizing the other. Um, and then as formal versus informal cooperation or the number of partners, if it's a bilateral cooperation or multilateral, um, if it's commission-induced or state-induced or if it's industry-induced. So um, what kind of initiatives do we have here? In fact, what we find is that we have a multi-level governance system on the one hand, so you will always find a multi, multiple level cooperation um, system on the other side of the, of the line. So just to give some examples and to, to get you back on your feet when it comes to this conference, um, we, we exchange knowledge here. This is a form of cooperation, of course. And you will find um, also other forms of cooperation on the knowledge level. Um, for instance, is when you think of the ICT uh, uh, meeting in, in Lisbon next week or next week, uh, week after next week, the Safer Internet Day is something where information has been uh, shared and knowledge has been ex exchanged. Um, what I want to give you here is some new core area for knowledge sharing. Um, the move from, as we have seen, from manual to semi-automated or totally automated high-scale classification systems poses the question, what experience do you made with, have you made with those, so with those, uh, those systems? So that's a core area, I think, in the future that you have to implement in, in conferences like this. Also, you need more and more technical infrastructure for classification in digital environments. So it's not only the IT guy, it's the classification bodies as an entity that have to be up to date when it comes to technical, um, technically providing inf information, um, age classification, and stuff like that. Um, and maybe a blasphemic thought, but if, if those two new areas of knowledge sharing come into your world, maybe you should think about of in, in including or inviting new players that can help um, because they have high-scale automated classification systems around. Cooperation on the classification levels, we have plenty of those examples. Peggy is, I think, the most prominent one. NICAM is also one, um, also with uh, regard the the uh, intertwining um, role of NICAM and, and PEGI. Um, IARC is one that also tries to cooperate on the, the classification level. We saw you rated. Um, we heard about the Nordic country, countries uh, that, that try to discuss uh, classification um, procedures. And of course, you all have these intra-community in, intra or intra-country country meetings of classifiers. Um, just one thought regarding PEGI, because we saw that in this comparative research uh, study. It got, it's got a critical role when it comes to internationalization, because PEGI has to stick to their, to their age groups. So if you want to harmonize or make s uh, systems convergent, then you have to stick to the PEGI age brackets, because otherwise you will balkanize uh, the PEGI system uh, because you have different age brackets in, in each country that PEGI is, is around. So there is a critical role for PEGI when it comes to, to uh, harmonization. On the policy level, uh, those are the ICT coalition, uh, the CEO coalition that I think ceased to exist. Um, we heard about the InHope network, the, um, but also ad hoc 
meetings like the Net Children Conference that my institute conducted in Berlin in, in this spring. Uh, the, the risk when it comes to policy cooperation is that you always have a race to the bottom of arguments uh, when it comes to necessary agreements, when you have to issue guidelines uh, or best practice tips or something like that, then there will always be someone who says, oh, I'm feeling I'm binding to, to these provisions, so we have to lower them. That's a race to the bottom, and, and that is a risk for those cooperations. Last level of cooperation is the one on the technical level, and the one we heard a lot of, um, about is IARC, because they also uh, provide a fully integrated technical infrastructure for the app stores here. Um, and another one is a shameless self-promotion because I'm the project coordinator for that one that is Miracle that you already heard of, most of you I, I suggest, um, which is trying to provide a data model for age classification information. So um, to show the feasibility of implementing interoperable age labels and show the added value of those things. So it's not about classifying content, it's about making the expertise and the information that you all have at hand interoperable on a technical level so machines can understand and can transfer, provide that information, aggregate that information. Um, so this is not about harmonizing age ratings, um, but the harmonizing the metadata fields for media content in, in this regard. So um, what we try to achieve there is that we provide a very flexible, very open and future orientated uh, vocabulary for your age classification information that you can fit your data onto uh, and then provide it in a common data format, format so that ev everyone who's interested in this classification data don't have to learn your technical infrastructure, but just retrieves your data in the same format from every source that you can think of. So it's highly appealing for those that have to work uh, with a lot of different age classifications from different schemes. We have open working groups uh, that tried to give some examples how you can use Miracle datasets and open web labeling on user-generated content or social media platforms with the help of U-rated um, positive content or uh, connected TVs and HBB TV, where also different types of media end up in one convergent device. So everything that helps you understanding the different schemes uh, of age classification uh, is, is of absolute necessity. We do hackathons two weeks from now, 19th and 20th October in Brussels, so if you want to come around, uh, we will code more, more new apps based on those Miracle datasets. Um, and we will see what we come up with when it comes to new and inno innovative uh, apps and services in this context. So my last slide is just an outlook. Maybe three questions for the next conference next year. <laughs> um, we saw that there are a lot of initiatives are ongoing, and there will more c more will surely come. Um, I have the slight feeling that I think it was David Cook who said mix and pick approach might be a good a good thing to do. And I have the feeling that we are already in the middle of it. We already pick and mix when it comes to cooperation. Where does cooperation make sense? So um, I want you to ask yourself as classification bodies, um, where, where do you think play, uh, your institution plays a role or plans to play a role in this new context? How, how actively do, do you plan to shape this new area? Do you feel like pushed into it, or do you want to, to, well, turn it into your thing, like, for instance, uh, NICAM and, and BBFC currently do? How do you want to achieve a level playing field in international cooperation? I think ERGA was um, a good example for the uh, broadcast and video on demand and, uh, regulators. So wh what about an European uh, association of classification bodies, so you can speak with one voice in, in the political uh, field uh, at EU level. And last but not least, um, how, how can we find out what limitations interna internationalization has? Where can it actually bring progress? And where will projects be doomed or run into oblivion because it's 
it does make sense on an international level. So that the last question already has an answer that we heard, I think, during the last two days. We will never know that. What are the limitations uh, without international cooperation? So you have to do it to, to know it. That was my part, and I give you a relaxing bunny now um, <laughs> to, <laughs> to feel well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Stefan Dreyer. Thank you. Are there any questions to Stefan? Many, Many questions, yeah. yeah. It's just a synthesis, <laughs> so it, it was everything that you said already. Yeah. So. <laughs> but you put it together. You want to ask something, or maybe we discuss it at the next conference, the open questions, or are there anything I want? No. Then thank you, Stefan. So